Good day to you. This is part five in our series in answer to Jews for Judaism. Enjoy. We see, by the way, that Paul just seized upon one verse which says that faith can be counted as righteousness. What Paul ignores are the next few verses I cited for you. For example, Deuteronomy 6.25 says, and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, just as he commanded us. So what is considered to be righteousness is not simply having faith. In the Jewish Bible, the emphasis is on living according to that faith. If you go through not just the question of why was Abraham chosen, but think very carefully. Our relationship with God as a Jewish people. What is the foundation of our relationship with God as a people? The Bible is very clear about this. Look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 6. It's the third paragraph here. God says to the Jewish people, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I mean that God is saying that the chosenness of the Jewish people is based upon our observance of the Torah. And we will see this theme repeated over and over and over again. So for example, Skip one paragraph and go to where it says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. God will establish his covenant, not only with those people who have faith in him, but who keep his commandments and obey his laws. He says, You shall therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments that I command you this day to do them. And it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments and keep them and do them, then the Lord your God will keep you to the covenant and the mercy that he swore to your fathers. In the next passage, Deuteronomy 26, this day the Lord your God has commanded you to do these statutes and judgments, and you shall therefore keep and do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have avouched the Lord this day to be your God and to walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken to his voice. And the Lord has avouched, he's promised to you this day to be his particular peculiar people as he promised you and that you should keep all of his commandments. So you see, we can't go through all the passages. There are dozens which repeat the same idea over and over. The Bible hits us over the head with it that our relationship with God is based upon the observance of the Torah. The book of Psalms, chapter 103. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness to, his ch to children's children to such as keep his covenant and those that remember his commandments to do them. Jeremiah chapter 7. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in all the way which I command you, that it may be well with you. Again, it's all based upon not simply having faith, but observing God's commandments. Now, this is not the most critical issue in the world. Why was Abraham chosen? Why were we chosen? But if you want to know from a Jewish perspective, one of our main issues with the New Testament is what the New Testament teaches about the obligation to keep the Torah. Let's just look at a few passages. Again, there are many, many passages. We just chose a few here. I want you to first understand, and I want you to listen carefully to me, that it's quite possible, it's quite possible that Jesus of history, not the Jesus that Christians believe in, it's quite possible that Jesus of history himself never intended to start another religion, never intended to abolish the Torah, and there seems to be good reason to believe 
that Jesus and his immediate followers were Torah-observant Jews. We have many other lectures that you can listen to on this topic, but it seems, at least prima facie, that the earliest movement of Jesus and his students did not come to negate the Torah. But what happens is pretty clearly that Paul, who again writes most of the New Testament, Paul, someone who never met Jesus, never met Jesus, becomes the primary teacher of what Christianity became. Meaning Christianity is not really based upon the teachings of Jesus. There's very little in Christianity based upon the teachings of Jesus. Christianity is based upon the teachings about Jesus by people who never met him, like Paul. The thing you have to understand about Christianity is that it's not the same as the ancient nation of Israel. It's, an, it's something new. It's something different. Um, the ancient nation of Israel, if you have to look at God, uh, the reason God is doing things in history, uh, the ancient nation of Israel was set up to compete and to uh, witness to the other nations around them, uh, namely Egypt and Babylon, Assyria, the Hittite, uh, the Canaanite, in, in some sense, that um, God was uh, making his play on the world stage in ancient times and 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 the the structure of the nation of Israel reflects that uh, that he would put a nation in among the nations to showcase who he is and to contrast himself as compared to other gods I mean even those even though those other gods aren't gods, to showcase to all those people. Um, you know, a case in point would be Jonah being sent to Assyria to tell them to repent. Uh, they repented immediately because they had heard of the God of Israel and they took him very seriously. And I imagine Egypt took him very seriously also. So there, that was God working in that time. Now, in, as we read earlier in Jeremiah chapter 31, with, with, with contrasting the Old and the New Covenant, uh, see, Starting in verse 31, See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, a, co a covenant which they broke. So it's not going to be like that covenant. It's something different. Though I espouse them, declares the Lord, but such is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put, okay, here's the covenant. I will put my teaching into their innermost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. Then I will be their God and they shall be my people. So you understand here, it's a different covenant, and it's not written on stone. It's not written on paper. It's written on the hearts of God's people. Okay? No longer will they need to teach one another and say to one another, 
heed the Lord, for all of them, from the least to the greatest, shall heed me, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their sins and remember their sins no more. So um, <clears throat> we can see there how it is a different covenant. Um, now, I've been thinking a little bit about how to describe that and uh, how to describe the ministry of Jesus and then the, uh, the reaction of the apostles afterward. You see, the new covenant didn't begin until the resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus walked the earth, he walked in the Old Covenant, in the Covenant of Moses. And he fulfilled that covenant. Now, um, by, by his blood sacrifice, overshadows all the Levitical pri priesthood sacrifice. Because if... Um, I think it was Orion, the um, a Christian Egyptian Coptic uh, teacher in, in those times that did this massive study uh, that you could access. It, it it shows every stitch, every thing, every little thing, every number, every stitch, every action in the Levitical uh, uh, ritual offerings is pointing towards Christ or symbolizing God and Jesus Christ. So um, that, that all becomes prophecy. It, it, it's, it's an obligation that has been fulfilled. By believing in Jesus, you have fulfilled those obligations. Not to say that you don't have any other obligations, but um, that's how that works. Now, uh, so the, the, the new covenant begins after the resurrection. So Jesus isn't really uh, the physical leader of the new covenant. He's a spiritual leader. He's... Uh, uh, the son of David that has been brought into the kingdom of God ahead of us. And he's vouching for us. He's representing us in the court of God. Now, um, Jesus, when he was at the Last Supper, okay, in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, uh, which is the uh, at the time of during the Last Supper, before the crucifixion, when Jesus was explaining to his, his disciples how uh, when he leaves, he will send the Holy Spirit to them. And, and the Holy Spirit that enters into them that is the writing of God's law upon their hearts. That is the new covenant. So that happens after the resurrection. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus was teaching the old covenant. Everything he was teaching, he was teaching the Torah, but connecting the Torah to the new covenant. It, because they are from the same God. They are the same law. He was um, describing uh, parables of examples of how you would apply those principles in your daily life. Um, and how there's a transcending of the law. Who would not take his his lost sheep out of a hole on the Sabbath, you know, things like this. Um, there, there, are, there are things that are lawful, and then there are things that are more than lawful. Um, 
there, there, like the Apostle Paul would say, there is no law against love. So um, it's this transcending of the Torah where, where it's not erasing the Torah. It's taking the Torah to a new level. And so now, having said that, now the apostles, you can think of it like the rain. The, the, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit is like the rain. It falls on everything. And, and that is now, the rain doesn't just go on the leaves of the trees and just for the trees. It goes on everything and it permeates the ground. And then the trees draw it up from the ground. So it's not, uh, it's a different process than a, a government, you know, a law like written in, on stone. So now these people, they are just people. They're, Peter was a fisherman. He didn't know, he knew the, the he didn't know the, the scriptures any more than anyone else in his town. Uh, he was a fisherman. And same with John. They, uh, most of the apostles were just general tradesmen and people, common people. And they wrote down, and, uh, and they didn't even necessarily write it down. People who heard them speaking about what happened wrote down what they said. So it's, it's almost second hand. But it's still very powerful because everybody wanted to know what did Jesus say. So all, all of these rumors and um, it's like the, the, the movement of the Holy Spirit was directing these Gospels to be written. Because nothing like that happens without God's providence. Now, it doesn't mean that it's historically perfectly correct either, because the people writing it didn't know those things. So, but, but what is important is in there. What is important is the matters of the heart and the matters of the things that I've been talking about. Now, the difference with Paul, how Paul became a great a apostle, is that Paul was educated. He was educated in the temple. And he was very familiar with the scriptures, with all the prophets. And so he could articulate these things in a, in, and, and relate it to the Torah and to the entire Tanakh uh, much better than any of the others could because he was educated in those things. Um, now, he did meet Jesus, but he met Jesus after the resurrection. He never met him before the, well, we don't know if he met him before that, but that's not the point. The point is he met him after that, and he was baptized, and uh, when Jesus appeared to him, he put into him his mission that you will preach to the Gentiles far and wide. Uh, it's um, so it's not you know it's like it's like God spoke to Moses out of the bush. Well, you're not going to say that uh, Moses never met God. Moses spent a lot of time with God. In fact, he spoke with them face to face, I think. Abraham had dinner with God. So, you know, you can't say, well, Abraham never met God because you can't see God and live. Abraham had dinner with God. So I don't know. Like, those things, uh, it's easy to sit there and point fingers. But you, you must understand that the, the new covenant is a different situation than the old covenant 
And it doesn't take away from the Old Covenant because the Old Covenant as we have it here in the Tanakh is holy. It's the Word of God. It's the prophets. It's Moses. It's the Torah. This is very important because how can he tell the beginning from the end? This is how he tells the beginning from the end. And he tells the end from the beginning. So um, it's very important. It, it, it shows a lot of principles of God. And uh, Christians, through the Holy Spirit, are led to come and read these things and to study these things. And they learn more and more about this this thing, this this power that's drawing them to learn these things. So, you know, to say that Paul never met Jesus and that he made up something is um, it's not true because first of all, the things that Paul taught is right along, right in tune with what Jesus taught. It's not different than what Jesus taught. And Jesus is not different than what the prophets taught. So um, if you think it's different, then maybe you're different. Maybe you have some thinking to do about these things. So what happens is when Paul has his run-ins, when Paul meets up with those original followers of Jesus who knew Jesus and walked with Jesus, they're suspicious of him. And one of the reasons that they were suspicious of him, you'll see right here, they say in Acts chapter 21, and they are informed about you, Paul, that you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Paul, we're hearing about you, that you're teaching the Jewish people in the diaspora, because Paul did not hang out in Israel. Paul left Israel to go around the diaspora, the Greco-Roman communities, to preach his vision of who Jesus was. And these followers of Jesus, the ones that knew Jesus and walked with Jesus, they're saying to Paul, wait, Paul, we're hearing about you, that you're teaching the Jewish people who are among the Gentiles in the diaspora to forsake Moses, not to observe the Torah anymore, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children neither to walk after the customs. This is a rumor they were hearing about Paul. Now why in the world would they hear such a rumor? Maybe because that's what was going on. Okay, I don't know whether Rabbi Skovic is doing this intentionally or not, or whether he's just cherry-picking verses out of the New Testament. Uh, but uh, that is a misrepresentation of what actually happened. Um, now, Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. And the question was, do Gentiles need to be circumcised and observe the law of Moses? And the answer was, in Paul's mind, no. Because um, the, 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 uh, the new covenant of God is going out to all nations. And what we learn from later Christians like uh, Justin Martyr of the second century the, the 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 idea is that uh, when when the law of God is written on your heart, every nation don't necessarily have to give up every one of their customs and all become like one uh, one custom for the entire world. Is that each nation adapts their customs? to these things that they have learned and that um, that there's still uh, 
um, different customs and different flavors of nations around the world that but they all are uh, conscious of God and seeking God this this is this is the way they viewed it so for the Jews then they viewed it that okay Jews can keep Moses and keep their customs and learn of Christ but the they 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 should not uh, impose their customs upon other nations. That uh, this is not the old covenant going to the nations; it's a new covenant going to the nations. So there is a difference there. And the important thing was to learn the principles of righteousness from God and to, to learn the principles of Jesus Christ and how that is applied to your life. So now the, the, uh, the, the customs of the Jews are the customs of the Jews and that they would that, that would be for the Jews. And so the apostles had a meeting. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barnabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren of which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Syria and Cilicia, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these, necess than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. And now Paul, um, Paul, I guess he seems to have agreed to that, but he didn't actually teach that. Um, because he taught more along what we talked about earlier from the book of Romans, is that first you work on the inner self and the, uh, the um, motivations. First you work on your motivations for what you're going to do, and then you start to keep the law through that. So Paul was more concerned about that aspect. So now what uh, Rabbi Skobak has brought up here is that uh, Paul was coming to Jerusalem again for um, for another meeting. And um, now Paul, um, a prophet, had prophesied that he when, when he goes to Jerusalem, he would be bound and sent to Rome and uh, his people who loved him um, 
the congregation begged him not to go, but he said he's ready to both be bound and die for Jesus. So he he had a he had this uh, knack of knowing what was going to happen and understanding what was going on, and he knew that he was being going to be brought to Rome. This is uh, Acts twenty one starting in verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. That is the Christian congregation in Jerusalem. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when we, he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So we're in Jerusalem now, and there's thousands of Christians who are Jews, and they are all zealous for the law. And they are informed of you, because people are talking about you, saying you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude needs to come together, for they will hear that you are come. So we have to deal with this because they're coming and they all think that you're doing this. Do therefore this, what we say to you. We have four men which have a vow on them. Then take, so these four men are still following the law of Moses and they are in the Christian congregation. He says to Paul, take and purify yourself with them and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning you are nothing, but, yet, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. And as touching the Gentiles which, we, which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. So there was, there was this confrontation going on between the Jews who were not Christians and the Jews who were Christians and Paul. So the Jews who were Christians were very welcoming and accepting acceptable of Paul and his ministry. But the Jews who were not Christians stirred the people up against Paul. And now Rabbi Skobak he seems to think that uh, they were suspicious of him. They were not suspicious of him. You can also look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Or we'll say 14 just to give it some context. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. He's, he's slow to anger, so account that as your salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, 
has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So there's Peter's full endorsement of Paul. Okay, that concludes this video. There was one part that I uh, failed to answer. In the beginning of the video, Rabbi Skovic talks a lot about obedience. And that's true in the Torah. It's uh, repeatedly, God says, obey my voice. Well, my answer to that is, how can you obey the voice of God if you ignore his prophets? And if, if he sends in the new covenant and you ignore it, that is not obedience to his voice. So you have to really look deeply into these things to see whether they are true or not. And you will find that they are true. And so to believe is to obey. The very destruction of the temple shows that it's impossible to keep the entire law of Moses without a tent of meeting and without a temple. Um, it's not enough just to say, well, we're keeping it as much as we can. The, the fact is, is it's not being kept in that regard. Uh, but through Jesus Christ and through believing in him, it is being kept, and there is an obedience to God's word. You know, it's, it's a tough thing to get uh, your head around and to think about things that seem to be sacrilegious, but when you see it, it's actually the opposite. I guess I could give a little testimony at this time about that particular thing. When I first became a believer, I started by believing in the Torah, in Moses, because I was reading the Bible from the beginning to end. And I believed the Torah. I believed the prophets. I didn't understand it all, of course, on the first read. But then I came to the New Testament and learned about Jesus. And I had a really tar hard time with that. Of, uh, a new God, uh, uh, a different, um, seemingly different law, seemingly different everything. And was this idolatry? Was this um, going against the law? But as I wrestled with it and learned more about it, it's almost like a death. It's, um, you have to die before you can be raised back to life. And um, to take that leap and to say, well, maybe this is true. Maybe Jesus is true. And when you start to look at it from that perspective, then you find out, even in the Torah, he's talking about Jesus in many places. And, and it actually is the same God. It's not a different God. So that's the thing that's really hard to get your head around for someone who believes the Torah. Um, it's not a different God. It's the same God from a different perspective. Well, I'll see you in the next video. Uh, good day.